Hello, I'm Phyllis Wilson, an Army veteran and president of the Military Women's Memorial. Located at the gateway to Arlington National Cemetery, we are America's only major national memorial to tell the story of women's military service to the nation. It is a particular honor for the memorial to partner with American Veteran for tonight's program. Women have served in or with the United States military, beginning with the American Revolution. But until recently, we seldom heard about them. And only on rare occasion do we read about military women in our history books. For nearly three decades, the Military Women's Memorial has been collecting these remarkable stories of our female patriots and preserving them for the American public and future generations to know and learn of their service. Today, 300,000 women's personal stories of service reside with the Military Women's Memorial and new stories are added every day. We are particularly grateful to American Veteran for including women's voices in this important American story. Tonight, we are previewing the PBS series, American Veteran, which aims to connect our nation's civilians and veterans in a searching conversation about the veteran experience and what it has meant to serve this country from the beginning of the Republic to the present. Powered by firsthand and deeply poignant accounts of those who have served from their entry into the military, through their time in service and beyond, these stories are woven together with the history of military experience and military civilian relations, providing a deeper understanding of both the individual and our nation's journey. We are honored to have President and CEO of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Pat Harrison, join us for opening remarks. Pat is the longest serving CEO at CPB, increasing funding for education, local journalism, and diversity in public media. She is a strong supporter for sharing the voices and experiences of our nation's veterans and building local connections to address solutions to the challenges many veterans continue to face. Good evening, and thank you, Phyllis, and the Military Women's Memorial for co-hosting this event with public media. I'm Pat Harrison, President and CEO of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, CPB. I was very pleased to know Air Force Brigadier General Wilma Vaught who advocated for the Women's Memorial and served as MWM president. As we all know, she was one of the most highly decorated military women in U.S. history, breaking bureaucratic and gender barriers in the armed forces and paving the way for women in the military. I remember when I interviewed her for my book, A Seat at the Table, she said as a little girl, whenever someone would ask her what she wanted to be when she grew up, she would always answer, in charge. What a great response, inspiring young girls everywhere. So it's really an honor for me to be here tonight to celebrate women's leadership and service to our country. CPB is proud to be part of this tribute to the men and women who served our country in the armed forces. They represent those values of courage and service, sacrifice and leadership that are essential to our democracy. I'm also proud that CPB has made a strong commitment over the years to tell the stories of our men and women in uniform. In 2010, we funded a welcome home broadcast event for Wisconsin's Vietnam vets. It was attended by more than 70,000 veterans, families and friends, and a long overdue thank you and appreciation for their service. Our funding has made possible public media stations work through the Veterans Coming Home Initiative, as well as public media programs such as The Warrior Tradition, Military Medicine, and Ken Burns's The Vietnam War. And now we're providing support for GBH's and PBS's American Veteran, a broadcast, digital, and podcast series that's inspiring conversations throughout the country 
hosted by local PBS and NPR stations. John F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. But today, too few people are responding to that call to service. America is home to nearly 18 million military veterans, from the greatest generation to the men and women coming home from recent tours in Afghanistan and Iraq. Their stories are important, and through American Veteran, we'll meet the men and women who, through their service, make our freedoms possible. Thank you, Phyllis, the entire MWM team, and the veterans and families here tonight. My appreciation also to John Abbott and the GBH team for ensuring the voices and stories of our veterans are shared on all of public media's platforms. And I hope after you watch American Veteran on PBS, you'll be inspired to visit the Military Women's Memorial just outside of Washington, D.C., and learn more about our military heroines. Now let's take a moment to watch a short preview of the film series before we start tonight's panel and discussion. <laughs> I flew with B-17 bombers. I volunteered for missions because I couldn't stop. It was just too exciting. I was an aerial door gunner. As a woman, I had to prove myself day in and day out. We cried, we laughed, we killed. We did everything together and for one another. You think you're uncomfortable hearing my story? Imagine how uncomfortable it was living it. When I put on that uniform, I represented the United States of America. And you know what? That's still who I am inside. Being a veteran is like speaking a different language. And when you're around these people who have served, you feel understood. We are living history. I am primary source. I'm telling you my story. My name is Kelly Kennedy. I'm an Army veteran who served in Desert Storm, as well as in Mogadishu, Somalia. I now work as Managing Editor of The War Horse, a nonprofit veteran and military news newsroom. I also worked as a consulting producer for PBS's American Veteran Series. I'm so proud to be here and so, help, well, so happy to welcome you to this panel. Our guests are amazing and you're in for a treat. First, we have Micheline Bigman an Army veteran and the president and founder of the Native American Women Warriors. We have Shoshana Johnson, a former prisoner of war, Army veteran and author of I'm Still Standing, and Edie Meeks, a nurse who served with the Army Nurse Corps during the Vietnam War. We also have with us Judith Vecchioni, a co-executive producer of American Veteran, and Shane Brendan, a Navy veteran, comedian, writer, actor, and host of American Veteran, Keep It Close. You can ask questions of our panelists using the Q&A feature on Zoom at the bottom of your screen. You'll be able to ask questions throughout the hour. Throughout the hour. And now we'd love to show you a preview of American Veteran episode four, The Reckoning, which will air on Tuesday night. I was so sick of people asking me if I was someone's girlfriend or someone's wife, and why did I care so much about veterans' issues? I had one woman walk into a room, and she literally reached across me to thank the guy next to me for his service. Not that I want to be thanked for my service, but don't like reach over me and act like I'm not even there. And I was just like, I should have got this tattoo on my forehead. I think society expects a veteran to be my father's age and to have like a really cool trucker cap that has some patches on it. 
you know, maybe like a VFW t-shirt uh, is probably the guy that, you know, runs the 4th of July parade. I think people who don't look like they're veterans have sort of a double burden where it can already be, depending on your experience, is a difficult thing to talk about. But then you're also trying to prove it. You know, Veterans Day comes around and people look at me and it doesn't scream Marine, it doesn't scream Veteran, doesn't scream Major General, doesn't scream First Latina to make General, doesn't scream anything. You know, it just screams little old lady trying to get her, her free donut at Krispy Kreme. Shortly after I'd gotten back from my deployment, my husband and I were out to dinner with a couple of friends. One friend turned to the other friend and said like, hey, did you know that you know Annie just got back from this deployment? She was going out with the teams and doing the, the direct action missions. <laughs> and the other friend sort of gestures towards me but looks at you know the first friend and kind of goes, she did that? And I, was, I wasn't really offended, I was more amused, but I was like, she's sitting right here and she can hear you and yes, she did that. Like, not everybody has the crew cut and the clean-shaven sort of stereotypical look. So I think probably several of our panelists have had similar experiences and probably members of our audience as well. Uh, Phyllis, our first speaker, has done so much to make sure that veterans feel included as, or to make sure women feel included as veterans in the veteran community. Uh, and Judith, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the goals were of the series as well as the, the podcast. Why, what were you thinking about as you put this together? For all of the, the project, from the films to the podcast to the digital shorts that Shane was part of, um, our goals were to give a platform for veterans to explore and showcase their own experiences. And to us, that meant veterans from all five branches of, of the service, men and women, different uh, conflicts or periods of, of military service, um, you, you name uh, different races, different sexual orientations. Um, it was important to us to make a wide selection of um, veterans so that we really understood that um, the veteran experience mirrors so much of America and and presents that opportunity for discussion. I was wondering if each of you could talk a little bit about that experience, that, that feeling like you're part, you're included, you're part of the veterans community, or, or possibly an example of when you didn't feel like that. Uh, Shoshana, can we start with you, please? Well, I definitely feel like a member of the veteran community, even if people don't recognize me as a veteran. Um, I think one of the first instances um, I had an issue was in the VA, where I was going for an appointment and they, they, they were calling Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson. And I looked around because Johnson is a common name. Then I was like, S. Johnson? Oh, yeah. And I said, is Ms. Johnson? Thank you very much. It's a medical appointment. You can look and see if it, most of the time it has F or M for male or female, but they just assume. And I'm thinking, we're in the VA. How can you make that assumption? But as far as with my fellow veterans, that, that connection is like automatic. I talk about my family and how large and how many of them are veterans. Uh, was it a couple weeks ago, I was uh, talking to my 90 year old great uncle who served in Vietnam. Here we are generations apart, conflicts apart, and we can sit down and talk to each other and we know exactly what we're talking, you know, I know exactly what he's talking about. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. My aunt, his wife is sitting there. Um, another one of my aunts is there and they don't get it, but he and I get it perfectly. That's that, uh, that bond we have. Micheline, you're, you're welcome home by, by your family. Just, it's portrayed in the, in the, I think it's episode three, and it brought me to tears. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and why it was important and, and if it was enough, if it was enough to make you feel like you were part of the veterans community. Um, in all actuality, um, I was pretty much surprised 
and the fact that they placed a war bonnet on me and then they put the um the red paint and the black paint and the black means victory <clears throat> they had to explain it to me <laughs> while they were doing it but it was just as soon as i i turned and i seen all the the families and all the the people were there to support that were from my from my tribe and my relatives and um it was just i was i was I couldn't fight the tears because I was like, wow, because I have to honestly say living on and off the reservation, they didn't know who Micheline Big Man was. But after war, they knew who Sergeant Big Man was. So when I came home, I came home as a warrior and uh, that finished, finished the battle. And um, it was, it was, my heart was racing. My, um, I was crying. And it was just, I felt just even that that moment that I felt like, wow, you know, my people actually, actually remembered, actually know that, that is, um, there was no words to even say thank you, you know, for the fact that, you know, you brought this huge welcome home for me. And they've, they've, they've actually started that before. Um, my uncle had started all that because he was a Vietnam vet. And he said he came home and there was nobody there waiting for him. He had to hitchhike home. So as a chairman and he said from that point on any veteran that came home especially from war they had a welcome home party i mean a welcoming such as such as that so it was it was awesome news news was there newspaper was there but i was just glad to see my family i think that mm. my own thing was just to hold my mom my dad my sister my brothers <laughs> Edie, you were one of the first groups of women to serve in in combat officially um and it's been a long haul, I think, for for women to be recognized as veterans. When did you feel like you you had reached that status? <laughs> and when do you, where do you think we need to go? Do you feel like it's it's enough now? Oh, uh, when we came back, we were not welcomed at all, and a lot of the official veterans groups didn't want us, and they wouldn't have known what to do with women anyway. And so a lot of us just shut down and just started working as hard as we could to not think about it and be normal. Normal. And it wasn't until a year before the dedication of the Vietnam Women's Memorial when my hooch mate, Diane Evans, who was the founder, called me and said, we really need help out East. Can you please help us? And so I said, okay. And I started talking just a little bit about it. I'd never talked to anybody about it. And just a little bit and a little bit. And then the dedication came. And there we were with women who knew exactly what we were talking about. And for the first time, I felt welcomed home. Because here were women, we were so glad to see each other. We knew exactly what they were talking about. You didn't have to explain anything. One of the things about being a woman when we were doing this was that no matter where you went, you were speaking to men usually, and you had to explain why you were there. But if you spoke to a group of women, you didn't have to explain a thing. They would say, well, of course you're, of course you're here. Of course you're supposed to speak up. Slowly, a lot of the men's groups really were very enthusiastic about taking women in. Mm -hmm. And I have another hooch mate who was uh, president of, I think it was the VFW out in Long Island. And she, she's quite a little dynamo. And now it's more accepted, but people are still kind of surprised. Like I still work at a hospital in the operating room. And when, People hear that I was a nurse in Vietnam, they come over, they can't believe, well, for one thing, now I'm much shorter than I was. And they're probably saying, how could this midget do this? Because <laughs> I'm only 4'10". I couldn't even get into the army now. <laughs> Luckily enough, I was tall enough back then. And for me, it's been, you know, and they say, oh, you're our hero. And it's just kind of amazing. Kind Shame of amazing. Was there a, a moment when you felt like you'd transitioned into that, that veteran community where you felt like you were part of something that was maybe bigger than, than what you'd experienced while you were in? 
Um, I, I, don't, I don't think there was any like a definitive moment uh, where I went from, you know, being active duty and then like feeling like, oh, now I'm a full on vet. I think just over time, uh, meeting other vets of similar age range as me, you know, and doing, you know, with, went to similar war campaigns, Iraq, Afghanistan. It was like the clip that, that was played at the beginning of the show uh, with a young woman talking about, you know, there was a certain, uh, there's a certain point of view that people have of a vet and what they're supposed to look like and all that. And, I'm, you know, I'm a fairly, I'm getting a little older, but I'm a fairly younger guy. You know, once I got out of, uh, out of uh, the military, I used my GI Bill to go back to grad school. So I think I, I just went from one world to another extreme one where I was just a full on college student again. So I, I didn't run into a lot of vets. I just became Shane, the dude who was majoring in creative writing for some reason. Uh, I, was just, <laughs> I was just surrounded by just a bunch of younger folks that really didn't have any concept and I wouldn't expect them to have any idea of what it is I was doing before they met me in class. Uh, as I got a little older and I started, uh, you know, getting around other other people, you know, going to VFWs and stuff like that, you know, checking in with the VA, you know, I started to started. I think that's when I started to feel more uh, included in the veterans community up here in Portland, Oregon. I don't run into a lot of vets, uh, and most of my friends are comedians, and uh, they didn't they didn't serve, so they didn't have, they have no idea they what they see in TV and the movies, they think I did all of that. I don't correct them all the time. I just let them think what they're gonna say, but. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, right, you know, projects like this and, and meeting you folks and, and getting to talk to people from, you know, from all over the world that actually served, I think that's one of the pivotal things that makes me feel included. Like I have this veteran family, you know. Judith, one of the things that I love about this series is that the, the veterans go so deep. They just bear their souls in this series. A World War II veteran talks about the passing of his wife and how she never knew what he experienced, which just grabbed me. Uh, people talk about the hardships of being gay in the military, pre Don't Ask, Don't Tell, or during Don't Ask, Don't Tell, of sexual assault, of losing limbs, or of how it feels to kill somebody. Um, but no one ever comes across as a victim. And I'm wondering, was that intentional on the part of the producers or was that the veterans that they come across as, as strong and, and um, human, I guess, for lack of a better word? We, we were incredibly honored by the trust that the veterans showed in telling their stories. It's, it's a really vulnerable thing to do. And as you're pointing out, they told us stories. Some of them told us stories they had not told anybody else before. Um, and I particularly love this, a, a quote from Dory Felton, who was a Vietnam era veteran who says, I am, I am primary source. I'm, he, as he tells his story, he's, he's got that to say. So I think the, the filmmakers, which uh, the, com the company that made the films is Insignia Films and the directors, Stephen Ives and Leah Williams, were really acutely aware of how, how much trust th they had been shown and what a responsibility that was. And then you get out of your, you get out of your own way. You let the veterans tell the stories that they have to tell and present themselves as they want to present themselves. That's, that's the way to honor that trust. And we were incredibly grateful to, to have that opportunity. It, it happens across all of the platforms. And Shane, didn't you feel the same way with the, with the digital shorts that you were, you were hosting? Didn't you feel the same sort of, oh my gosh, they're telling me these amazing stories? Oh, 100%. 100%. I mean, everyone had everyone had their own unique story, uh, ranging from something that was you know, lighthearted to something that you were surprised that they would be that vulnerable and go that deep. You know, one of my jobs, one of the things I tried to stay on top of as far as being a host of the digital series was, you know, before we even would even start taping, I would ask the producers to give me like maybe five or 10 minutes with the vet that I was going to talk to, to kind of like, you know, it's like, 
Shoshana was saying, like vets, we have this shorthand. We have this understanding of, of each other. And I had to, I wanted to let them know I'm not just a random guy that's just hosting this show. Like I'm also a vet. I also was boots on ground. I dealt with kind of similar things. Um, so, I mean, it really speaks to uh, a lot of vets from all walks of life really wanting to just tell their story. And, and you guys provided the platform for that. And I think, I think all the folks were grateful for that. As you guys were working with the producers, were there things that they asked that, that caused you to learn things about yourselves that you didn't expect or uh, questions you hadn't thought about before, baby? It was three years ago. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I watched, I watched intently because I was like, what did I say? <laughs> you know, wow, um, really that long I was, ago? yeah, I, I, I was listening to part of the, um, the podcast and I got distracted for something and I, I need to go back and listen to it because I don't remember. I, I, <laughs> most of the time, I don't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. So. <laughs> Difficult. I have no idea, but you know what? I what one thing I always try to do when talking to anybody is give them my truth. You know, um, especially at that time. I think if you had talked to me when I first came back in 2003, some of my answers would be different because I've had time to reflect on the situation, on where I was as an individual at that point in my life, and my views have changed as as I have changed and grown. You know, you look back and see things a lot differently. Hindsight's twenty twenty. You know, yep. your story was so public that, and and changing, evolving on the news as well. Was that was that odd or disconcerting for you to see that happen, or did you stay away from the news while that was going on? Uh, it was odd. It continues to be odd when random people come up to you. <laughs> Sometimes they recognize me, sometimes they don't. But when they talk about, you know, they talk about how old you are, where you were and things like that, and you've never met this person. Um, it can be, I think I've gotten a little bit used to it and hopefully I've gotten a little more gracious about it. When I first got home, it, it freaked me out. I was dealing with all the stuff I had to deal with and people came up to me and it, it freaked me out. Um, hopefully I've grown and become a little bit more gracious about it. As a matter of fact, uh, last week I got home from another trip um, visiting family and there was a letter with pictures and the person asked me to sign the pictures and, and send it back to them. They put in the envelope to send it back and everything. So I was able to sign it real quick, put it back in the envelope and ship it off. You know, I'm kind of used to that kind of thing now. Mm -hmm. When I first got home and they, things came to the house, I'd be like, oh my God, they have my address. And it, it would be <laughs> terrible. Um, so you grow. Um, like I said, hopefully I'm, I've become more gracious to people and learn how to deal with it better. Edie, in, in your session, you talk a little bit about, uh, I think it was a rocket attack and, and kind of hiding from that. Do you feel vulnerable talking about that? Or is that something that sort of a story that's grown with you over the years? What, how did you feel about telling the producers about that? Actually, the, the rocket attack, because we had so many of them, um, that was just like kind of part of your life. Mm -hmm. And so that wasn't difficult to talk about. What surprised me in the interview was that I s talked about the rape that I that happened to me because I had ne never talked about it publicly to anybody. You know, my psychiatrist has said, now tell your children that this has happened so that they can keep an eye on you, you know? And so I did, but I hadn't told anyone else. And then all of a sudden it just came out and I was so surprised and yet very comfortable because the people who interviewed us were so such comfortable people. They were so accepting, they were non-judgmental. They just were there to help you. Micheline, you had some vulnerable moments on camera. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about what, what you were feeling as you were, you were talking to the crew? Um, one particular is when I was talking about, I did a humanitarian 
um, mission. And um, I think I was at a pinnacle point whether uh, a young a young child was coming my way, whether because uh, in Iraq, I mean, it, it was known for for kids to even be strapped. I mean, they would have that the 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 um, the bombs on them so they were also suicide bombers but and i came across so many that had so much hate against america especially the soldiers so when they were when he was coming at me i was just i was scared i'm like what if i have to pull the trigger because i remember this one captain said i will stand on the red carpet with you if you have to make that choice and i mean with all the training and everything but when it came down to it i think i was praying at the same time i'm like lord please let this child turn because when i kept looking at that child there was a point where because i had a son about, seemed like it was about the same age i seen i seen my son i didn't see a, a, a young iraqi child and at that time i had broke down because i was like i can't do it i mean i was crying on the interview because i was like this is where the soldier had left and the mother took over because I don't think I would have been able to, but yeah, there was a, there was, that was one of my most vulnerable times, because I come from, uh, my, me and my siblings, me and my two brothers um, served in the military, all army, but only two of us went to combat. So me and um, my brother Franklin, we, we have a lot, you know, we have those vulnerabilities as well, so we kind of like lean on each other, but yeah, that, there was a few times that, you know, I, I kind of broke down and I was trying not to because I was like, I got to have that thick skin, be strong. But like I say, the people that were interviewing was so understanding. They were like, you know, you know, just keep going. So I was like, OK, even though my makeup all the way came all the way down because I cried it all off. <laughs> Could I just add one thing to what what Edie was talking? Actually, all of you are talking about, which is the process of being filmed and we have to thank the people who made it possible. It was three years ago that some of you were interviewed mm -hmm. and it, it takes a very long time to do this kind of project. And we have to thank the funders who, who made this possible, if, if I could. Um, the Wexner Family Charitable Fund, Battelle, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, who you heard from earlier, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase and uh, Analog devices. These these are the five organizations that really made it possible to, for us to spend the years and the time and do the research that enabled everyone to feel that they were being listened to. So just wanted Jane, to jump in. Asking, yeah. Did you say Mattel? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So are they going to make you know like Barbie a soldier now? <laughs> no, not Mattel, but Mattel. So, oh, okay. Mattel Memorial Institute. <laughs> okay. See, I was ready. I'm like, uh, you need right. to make Barbie a soldier, yo. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> and we were talking a little earlier about what it was about you that that you think made people feel comfortable talking. Did you ever feel vulnerable? with the people you are talking to and and can you talk a little bit about why what in your background or in your your manner do you think made it easy to have a conversation with you um i don't know i think i i like to consider myself a nice likable guy i guess uh <laughs> i just uh i i didn't want to i didn't want to overthink any of it uh you know i think me having the opportunity to be a host and be a part of this project in and of itself, uh, it was it's 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 probably the the, the most rewarding thing I've done uh, post military in my career. Uh, just a little bit about me. I I served in the Navy because my my dad served in the Navy. You know, legacy. I mean, most of my family is uh, Army, Navy, and Marine Corps. And my dad passed away in 2017. And out of all the, I mean, he's always been proud of everything I've done, you know, as, an, as a writer and an actor and a comedian. But the, the thing that really struck me and it kind of made it emotional for me uh, interviewing several of the different folks that I talked to, was I, I just had this thing in the back of my head the whole time, like, man, I wish the old man could have seen this. You know what I mean? I think he really would have, he really would have, I mean, like I said, he was proud of everything else that I've done, but this is the one thing where I feel like, you know, I would have I wanted him 
to, to be able to see. You know, and, and talking to several of the vets during the interview process, you know, the, the topic of family always came up, you know, and uh, and that's that's when I would have to, you know, I'd have to take a break. I'd look at my producers like, hey, you know, I need to get some water. I got some, something's going on in my throat, you know, <clears throat> you know. Uh, yeah, so I guess, I guess just uh, just allowing myself to be open and 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 try to to make a connection with all the different vets that I spoke to. Uh, I think that was the only way we were gonna get you know get that type of uh, get the type of storytelling, get the type of answers and responses that we got from the vets, uh, which was kind of difficult to do via you know Zoom. We were work. I was I was talking to people from all over the country while I was based here in Portland. So to really make a connection through this thing, you know, it took some trial and error, but we figured it out uh, towards the end there. So we're going to see one of those shorts that you worked on. Uh, you find it. So the American Veteran Project also includes podcasts, a place for veterans to share their stories, and a series of digital shorts that look at what people brought home from war with them. The items range from lip gloss to a puppy to a stone that helped a veteran quench his thirst. Up next, we'll watch an episode called Crowning Glory from the American Veteran Keep It Close series, and it's hosted by Shane. My name is Andrea Peters, and um, I'm a Lieutenant Colonel in the Army. For those who aren't familiar with the uh, Army hair regulations, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what they specified uh, back in the early days of your service? The Army regulation um, was very vanilla. For many years, representation of professionalism and beauty was kind of this long, flowing, bouncy type hair. We all conformed to what we believe was that professional state. And so most of the time people would choose to perm their hair. And so that was definitely what I did. A lot of races view perms as something to curl their hair. Well, in the textured hair community, we perm our hair to straighten our hair out. But your head is on fire because this relaxer is um, burning your scalp. My second deployment was as a deputy commander for the Corps of Engineers. As I was getting ready to go on a deployment, I'm looking at my baby girl run around the house with like towels on her head and kind of whipping it back and forth that European standard of having the long, bouncy hair, I said, oh no, we, we, we gotta stop this because I, I see the same thing that I dealt with as a young person and not being comfortable in my own space of my own natural hair. So at that point, I said, nope, I'm not putting a perm in again. So I, I went cold turkey on a perm, cold turkey. I absolutely loved it. But I was always looking over my shoulder because I felt someone would look at it as being not proper. But I think what was beautiful with the deployment too, I was actually able to use a pick, something that I had never been able to do in my entire life. It brought me back to black pride and black strength and just embracing oneself and the natural essence of um, black peoples. Now, this is a pic that you brought with you uh, on the deployment? It is. Can I show the pic? Is that okay? For sure, yeah. Okay. Let's see it. All right. So this is Oh, I pick. knew it was going to be that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I knew it was going to be that one. That's right. That's right. There's no because way it wouldn't be that one. <laughs> absolutely. Now, later on in life, the conversations really started moving with other leaders in the Army, where we looked at that regulation, and specifically as it relates to wear and appearance and the grooming standards, and we pulled it apart. What do we think it should be saying, and how would we recommend that change? What wasn't understood was the stress and the maintenance that it takes for a woman with textured hair to keep herself 
looking good to feel like she's ready to go out there and execute the way she needs to. We compiled this and we sent this up to headquarters. Everything that we recommended was adopted. So now there's a sense of femininity that has been given to women in the Army. I guess my pride and joy of seeing this regulation change because it wasn't just about hair. It was really about women truly being integrated into the Army the way they should have been in the beginning. I love that. It, it was such a controversially <clears throat> odd thing, and it seems so obvious now. I see how you nodding your head, Shoshana, as you were watching that when we were in. That was pre pre new regulation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there would have a problem with my hair the way it is right now because um, it wouldn't be uh, um, proper. I remember deploying and having to go get my hair braided because, um, you know, with the relaxer, I, I wouldn't be able to have access to it because um, you need running water to wash the chemicals out and all that kind of stuff. And then even as I got it braided, I had to watch how they were braiding it so it would fall into the, you know, the regulation so I wouldn't get in trouble for it um, just to do regular maintenance on my hair. and. Um, I also remember complaining about the way my hair looked when I got rescued. So, <laughs> yeah, that was, that was another thing. But it, it, is, is, it is something so basic. This is the way my hair grows out of my head. Yet they wanted to, put, you know, to conform to that regulation. They were telling me I needed to put a chemical in it, in my hair that basically burns your scalp, you know, and it's, mm -hmm. it's you know, they toxic chemical that they were like, they don't even understand and they didn't try to understand what it was like. They just basically conform. Um, I'm glad that they have opened their eyes to the fact that we are different yet the same. Um, we all are slightly different, which makes us unique and it makes us a stronger military because we have all those diverse people looking at problems in a different way to contribute to a solution, but we are all people and we deserve a certain amount of respect as uh, human beings and, 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 you know, we shouldn't have to harm ourselves basically to conform to a regulation um, that, that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Shane, it looked like you bonded over the pick. Were there other stories <laughs> where you just felt like something struck a chord? With you, no, it, it was. It's just one of those things where you know, uh, in the black community, it's it's like if you have a pick, nine times out of ten, it's going to be that one with the black fist on it. I, I grew up with, with. As soon as she pulled it out, I was like, of course, of course, of course. I said, what else would it be? So, uh, that I got a, I got a laugh out of that. But also, uh, 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 with that interview in particular, I think uh, it, we we bonded a little bit. There was a little bit of an understanding between the two of us, uh, just because I didn't. I think she may have been the one uh, black vet that I talked to. Uh, so, like like I said earlier, like you know, all vets do have a, a shorthand of language that we only know how to speak. But then you you have the whole layer of you know being African American and being in the military. There's another little there's another little shorthand there too. So that was that was a really fun interview to talk to her. It was, great. Well, it was soldier hard as well. Soldier hard as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah but not a woman there. But he had he had a you had some good bonding with him too. I did. I did. He was a fun guy to talk to. Uh, you know, a hip hop artist, and you know, I, I, I my hooch. Well, one of my deployments, I think it was it might have been my first tour in Afghanistan. The guys who lived next door to me, I can hear them uh, at night. You know, they're over there making music. One guy had a guitar. Another guy had a microphone. You know, so they they go on their walking talks for 10, 12 hours 
you know, during the day and then come back and I can hear them, you know, relieving stress over there. So that that was a connection with the soldier hard and I had too, you know, I was like that that's relatable. I understand. I've been there. Hmm. We have a question from the audience about mental health, and we've talked about this before, the different ways everybody dealt with the, the difficult things you've been through. Um, Shane, I remember you talking about comedy, using your comedy to, to kind of deal with some some stuff. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, oddly enough, I don't talk about the military at all uh, in, in, in any, I don't have any jokes about it. I think the, you know, just doing it in and of itself is, it's, it's been my therapy. Uh, my first time doing stand up was in, uh, it was, it was during, it was my last tour in Afghanistan where I was in the Helmand province and it was Christmas Eve and it was a snowstorm and I was a part of a mobilized team. So not snow, sorry, sandstorm, snow. It was a sandstorm. So the helos got grounded. So we were stuck there throughout, you know, the, you know, basically Christmas Eve, Christmas and the day after. So the, the MWR rep on base decided to lift everybody's spirits by having a, a Christmas talent show. And uh, my fight or flight has always been to be the guy joking around uh, with the unit and, uh, you know, just kind of cracking jokes during, uh, you know, rocket attacks while we're hunkered down behind T walls or whatever. Uh, and um, my uh, my lieutenant was like, you know, Shane, you, you can see yourself a bit of a smart ass. Why don't you get up there and tell some jokes to everybody? So he kind of forced me into it and uh, I just panicked and I went up there and just kind of made a whole, the whole fob kind of chuckle for a couple minutes and uh you know I got the bug and then when I got back uh stateside uh, to San Diego where I was you know uh, duty station back home uh, I walked into an open mic and saw a bunch of other people doing the thing that I did back in the dirt so I was like well you know if I can do it back there I can do it here nobody's shooting at me here this will be easier you know so <laughs> I just uh I've been rocking and rolling ever since and I think that was back in 2012 and uh it's been it's been a, like a pressure release valve you know along with you know, going to the VA and other kinds of therapy, you know, I myself am diagnosed with combat PTSD and, you know, hypervigilance and all that and uh, TBI. So I did all the medical stuff, you know, I, I'm following suit through with all that stuff, but also being able to, you know, make people laugh and make myself laugh. I think it's, it's a good balance. It's very therapeutic. Edie, I think you also were talking about how much VA helped you deal with, with your experiences in Vietnam. Um, it was interesting because when I first went to our local VA, um, they were kind of looking around for the guy that I was supposed to be bringing in. And I said, no, 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 it's me. And what happened was I stopped by a, uh, one of the outreach clinics that they have. And I just started crying. I think I had reached my peak of denial and just hit the wall and I just couldn't cope anymore with it. And so they immediately took me in and got me situated with a psychiatrist and a psychologist. And the psychologist that I had was wonderful because he really didn't know much about PTSD and women in the service, mm -hmm. but together we kind of worked it out together. And what we worked out worked. That was what was really great. And when it finally, I finally recognized the fact that I had been raped, he said, I can't, I won't keep you anymore, but I'm gonna send you to a psychologist that deals with this, she's a woman. And so I went to her and I've had a woman uh, psychiatrist ever since there. They've really, they, at Castle Point, they were just wonderful, wonderful to me. Micheline, you've done some some work for yourself, but also for other women, Native American women veterans. Can you talk a little bit about your your uh, dancing? Oh yes, um, I do the women's jingle, which is Ojibwe, and it's um, what the dress is considered a prayer dress and a dance of healing. And I want to say a lot of our um, Native uh, dances are some sort of healing. But Ojibwe, that one was particularly known for that. And a lot of us uh, ladies that are part of Native American Warriors, we really cling to that because 
when we dance, we're dancing not only for ourselves, for the healing, but also for the veterans and those that are broken. You know, um, not all wounds are visual. Sometimes we have a lot of the inner and a lot of that way of uh, dealing with it was one coping mechanism. And then one, I was, I was always working out. Even when I was downrange, when I was in Iraq, they said, sorry, big man, you're always working out. If I wasn't doing push-ups, I was, if I wasn't running, if I wasn't, you know, um, just, I had to constantly keep moving. And that was my way of coping with it. And then coming back, you know, along, along, uh, side with Edie, you know, doing the, um, going to VA and getting the, the help needed. Cause I'm also an MST survivor. So there's a lot that, um, a lot of the ladies that I, I work with, you know, we don't only have PTSD, but there's a lot of them that have that mental, military sexual trauma where a lot of them, you know, were raped. I was raped when I was in the military. So there's a lot of inner, and we really cling to each other, but our way of coping through it and just kind of bringing the light out is our dancing. That's amazing. And what do you do to keep, to take care of yourself, Shoshana? Um, a lot of therapy. I, 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 I rely on my family heavily, heavily. You know, um, my aunt's an Air Force nurse. And when I came home, you know, we got some mental health help in the beginning with our debriefers and stuff like that. But I backed away from the mental health aspect. And I remember my aunt came to town and she, she chewed out the colonel. Um, talking about how I needed to be seeing someone and, and, and you know, demanding I get care. Um, my family has been there and because of their military experience, they can see things that, you know, probably a civilian family wouldn't see. Mm -hmm. And, you know, despite that, people always think, well, you're doing so well. I said, I'm not doing as well as you think because I've been in a hospital three times in, in, since I've been home. Um, even with all that support, even with going to the VA and medication and therapy, I still struggle. But I've also learned that there is no cure for this. It is an ongoing issue that I'm learning to live every day with and cope with. And that really helped me. Stop thinking that, oh, in three months I'm going to be cured and I'll be back to normal. Mm -hmm. This is my normal. This mm -hmm. is the normal me dealing with it every day, dealing with my triggers, um, dealing with p interaction with people. And um, once I look at it like that, it became easier to deal with. But I, I more props to my family. I, I, I mean, it drives me crazy, but, but <laughs> they're fabulous. They're fabulous. Because I'll get a call out of nowhere talking about, hey, you, I haven't heard from you in a while. You okay? What's going on? And, and lots of times that saves the day. Everybody needs an auntie like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, Aunt Margaret. Aunt Margaret. We've got another question. Um, what, if any, personal or institutional barriers did you face earlier or later on in your career that may have guided your decisions or actions? It's a big question. <laughs> Ooh. Can you repeat the question? Yes. <laughs> yeah, because I didn't understand it. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what personal or institutional barriers did you face in your career that may have guided your decisions? So what walls did you come up across against and what did you do to, to, to get past them? <laughs> I'll answer first. Okay. okay. I got out of the service as fast as I could. <laughs> I had two years. You signed up for two years, and I spent one year in Vietnam and came home, and I was so angry. And I had, at that time, it's probably not true now, but at that time, I thought, you know, it seems to be that a lot of incompetent nurses stay in, and I don't want them to have control over my career as a nurse, which they would, because I was a lowly person. And there were captains and majors and colonels that would have control over me. So I thought, I'm getting out. And I remember them calling up and saying, now, would you like to be in the reserve? I said, no, I want out. <laughs> would you like to do that? No, 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 no. I think that at that stage, I was just so filled with anger 
at the army and at the government that I just, because, and then I just stopped talking about. It was as if I had never been in the army until my PTSD got so bad that I had to face that I had, and that I had to face the two years that I was there and everything that had happened to me and that happened to my patients. Mm. Does anyone else have an experience that you'd like to share? I mean, I, I no, you got it, you got it, you got it. I don't, yeah. I don't, I just, were there incidents where you, you got a little chauvinistic men push back? Yeah. But I also had a mouth and I, I had a big mouth, you know, um, <laughs> At the time, I thought I was being kind of uh, okay about it. But looking back, I was like, wow, it's amazing. I didn't get an Article 15. <laughs> the way I did some things. <laughs> so I, I, and they knew, you know, uh, they knew I wouldn't hold my tongue. So um, I kind of, yeah, I kind of broke some barriers right on my own. I didn't let them pigeonhole me. You know, when you know that you can do the job effectively and they can't hold that against you, you kind of become a little fearless. And I, I thank my dad for always um, pushing me and my sisters so hard um, and telling us we had a voice because I sure did use my voice. <laughs> what were you saying? Oh, I was trying to think. I think the only personal barrier that uh, I I had to deal with was uh is before I it was before I became aware that I, that there was a problem uh you know the PTSD was 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 starting to affect uh, my work I still I mean I remember I had just reenlisted uh, so I had four more years of service and I went on a deployment and uh, it was an eleven month deployment uh, in Afghanistan and when we went all over the theater all over the place. And it was just, it was a gnarly deployment, just like the ones I've gone on before. But I think, I don't know, something changed in me a little bit when I got back home, when I was on shore duty, uh, the, you know, trying to cope with it, trying to self-medicate. That's, that's when things started to get out of control a little bit. Mm -hmm. A lot of boozing uh, and a lot of just, uh, I don't know, just trying to stave away all the thoughts and not really knowing how to process everything. Uh, yeah, and I just knew that I probably had one more good tour in me, because uh, so I needed to, I needed to like self care basically. You know, I, at that point, once I finished out my my contract, ten years that's a good even number. I think I did my part. I did I did good enough. Now I need to get out and and take care of the mental and and take care of myself so I can take care of my family. You know, I have this family now. I didn't have it when I was a young guy in there, gung ho, ready to be up at the front line. But you know, towards the end there, got married and I had a little girl. So I had something to miss, you know. So my my personal life and my mental health, uh, I think, really uh, drove me towards, you know, okay, I, I think it's time to hang it up, yeah, take care of the things now. Micheline, it sounds like you were able to speak up for yourself pretty good. Oh yes, because my last name, I ended up in a lot of line units, artillery, combat engineers, and I was a diesel mechanic. And during that time, there wasn't very many female diesel mechanics because, you know, it's always clerical or medical. And I kind of stepped out of the norm and I thought, well, let me try to challenge, you know, something. My dad was a mechanic, so I thought, okay, you know, I'll let me try mechanics. And it was my mouth, you know, I think I have to honest, I, I thank God because um, I can honestly say on one hand, I can count how many times I had article, I mean, not article 15s, but uh, counseling statements because my mouth. Because I'm like, I'm, and I'm only, I'm, I'm small. You know, and then my last name is Big Man. So they thought, you know, and they thought I was a guy. So, and I'm in an all male battalion, you know, the only female. So there was a lot of challenges. Uh, there were times when I was scared, but I didn't show it. There are a lot of times when I had to tell them, look, don't let the size fool you. My mouth, I, I'll back up my mouth. And they found out real quick, I think, um, with the sexual harassment was really bad, but they, they, they found out don't mess with big man because you're going to have, have a boot in your mouth or she's going to come at you with a, I went after somebody with a tanker's bar and went after somebody with a screwdriver. I said, mess with me. I'm from the reservation. We do not play. And I'm only like, I'm only like five, three, 120 pounds. And I'm like, I'm like a spider monkey, you know, <laughs> I'm <gonna jump laughs> on you. 
<laughs> and I will get you. You know, you're gonna know that you had the wrath of big man on you. <laughs> That's terrifying. <laughs> Oh, man, awesome. awesome. <laughs> we have one final question from the audience, and that is, how do you feel when people thank you for your service? I, I, when I know it's sincere, and yes, we can tell when it's sincere, mm -hmm. um, it feels awesome, but sometimes it's kind of flippant. Oh, thank you for your service. I'm like, it, don't mm -hmm. say it if you don't mean it. Mm -hmm. Because... It's, it's like a disrespect, it's a slap in the face when you don't mean it, because you have no idea what we went through. You have no idea the sacrifices, and not just in wartime, in peacetime, we go out to the field for 30 days, we do all kinds of stuff, you know, training for that conflict that you don't know about. So if you don't mean it, then keep it to yourself because mm -hmm. it, it, it is much more disrespectful. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I think um, like some, I don't know, I know, so many times, um, a lot of times they don't think like women actually served and actually went to combat. I'll wear my hat that says I'm a disabled veteran or um, a native veteran. And a lot of times they just kind of look past me and there's, you'll find that one, you know, well, thank you for your service. Somebody bought me a McDonald's. Um, lunch and I was just man I was just excited and I was like next one's gonna be steak <laughs> I'm gonna buy a newer hat <laughs> and put my eagle feather on so I like it no <laughs> yeah so yeah but I have to honestly say you do have some that just say it just you know just to say it just like they say well I love you and it doesn't mean anything you got to have that sincerity either that you know don't 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 come at me because I'm going to be that spider monkey. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? I think for me, when people started saying that, when they learned that I had served, I think I was always surprised because for so many years, we were not recognized. Mm -hmm. Not just women weren't recognized, but Vietnam veterans weren't recognized. And then when they, for instance, <laughs> at work, when they found out that I was a Vietnam veteran, I mean, and these, these kids, and they are kids, according to me, are a lot younger than I am. And they were just like, oh my gosh, you did, oh, you're wonderful, and on and on and on. And I'm sitting there, not used to this. This isn't what we got when we got at home. So to me, it's, it's really been delightful. It's been surprising and wonderful and delightful. To me, it always feels most thankful or gracious when people sit and listen to our stories and to the stories of veterans. You know, you sent us over there. So listen to my, my story about where you sent me and think about it next time you send me mm -hmm. someplace. And mm -hmm. I feel like this series and this panel is a great example of people doing exactly that. And I think you guys are amazing. And this was this panel was amazing. And I'm I'm so proud to be here. So thank you. You're thank amazing. You. You're doing great. Yes. Heck yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to say, uh, I'd like to invite everyone to watch the final episode of American Veteran on PBS stations Tuesday night, as well as to visit PBS.org to view previous episodes as well to see uh, Shane's digital series and some podcasts, but also to share, share your own stories, which is super important. And thank you again for coming and good night. Can I share one thing real quick? No. Oh. It's just a picture, me, graduation day from boot camp and my dad. So, oh. That's the old man. That's yeah. nice. Created a very terrible yeah. place called the Rainforest Cafe in the mall. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Good night, everyone.